I'm going to read parts of a novel, this novel is called Disorderly Conduct. Uh, it's set in Queens in the early 60s. The main character is an 18-year-old kid named Buddy Sims, who's been arrested along with his friend for assaulting a policeman. So I'm going to, I'm going to read three little selections, which I hope will give you sort of the trajectory of the book. First one, uh, it's on a Saturday night after Buddy leaves his job. He works in an Italian delicatessen. He's going to take a walk for home. So I'll start there. Buddy left the store and paused in Scalzetti's alcove to adjust to the darkness. He zipped up his jacket against a biting wind and stepped down into the street. Notice this is different than poetry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different mood, different rhythm. So I'll start all over. He stepped down into the street. The deli lay at the intersection of Broadway and Roosevelt Avenue, where the subway and elevated line met with a hack stand and bus station. Buddy weaved through the stalled traffic on Broadway and into the crowd around the station. The glass wall of Bigfoot's restaurant exposed the interior like a doll's house, and with the clatter of dishes, Buddy breathed an air heavy with motor exhaust and steam table food. The meatloaf and fish sticks and macaroni and cheese with red pimento he, he could never resist. Although he lived here all his life, the picture before him didn't evoke monotony or boredom, but home. Not the home of the apartment, too small for him and his parents that he would have to leave, but the home of his job with Scalzetti, with the hypnotic aroma of cured meats and strong cheeses inside the small store. That sense of belonging to the deli, to these lights, to the press of people, was now under threat, and the dread of an uncertain future was part of his daily life. He walked up to 37th Avenue and tried to enjoy the feeling of accomplishment from the rolled up bills in his front pocket. He worked hard for that money. It was Saturday night and his friends would be up at the Golden Note drinking as if nothing had happened. They were the lucky ones, the ones the cops had chosen not to chase or would somehow escape when they saw the squad cars coming. Buddy may have been the only sober one that night. He'd never been much of a drinker. Any dizziness or loss of control resurrected images of his father in the days before his AA cure. Mr. Sims would come home from the Roosevelt Avenue bars and pass out either on the couch or in the bathroom. Buddy had long ago fixed on a single idea to get out of the house as soon as possible. <coughs> that was the plan. Join the Navy, see the world, even learn the trade. The old salts returned to the neighborhood with hash marks on their sleeves and tales of whores at every port from Nice to Naples and Singapore. But the trouble with Officer D'Angelo had put an end to those plans, at least for now. But he continued up to 82nd Street where the stores were still open, their window spaces hung with evergreens and blinking lights, with Santa and his reindeer hovering over the goods. He stopped at Harvey's swank shop and studied the display of sport shirts and fancy cufflinks. He looked over a sharkskin suit with a rolled collar shirt and matching tie and lapel handkerchief. The outfit was slick and dapper, but ever since the trouble, so much seemed frivolous. He had a decent suit anyway, dark blue, bought for court appearances. The trick in the courtroom was to look not neat, but not flashy. A little poor, a little meek, back straight, chin up, hands clasped as if in church. Not with his brow furrowed in anger and his arms defiantly crossed, as at the arraignment when he tried to tell Judge Urbino that Stephen Antonelli hadn't tried to take D'Angelo's service revolver, and that he, Bernard Sims, hadn't beaten the officer about the face and the body, <laughs> about the face and body, as the prosecutor announced to a shocked courtroom. At subsequent appearances, he and Steve were silent, facing the judge directly. They ordered they avoided eye contact with D'Angelo, who stared them down every time. An L train shook the ground, and Buddy passed Balfour's sporting goods, where he and his friend had bought their Spartan jackets, and then Fields' department store, where his mother had found the courtroom suit on sale. He stopped at a corner and remembered that confession at St. John's was still going on just one block. If only he could pray or confess his way out of the feeling that he'd done something wrong, not in trying to pull Steve away from the crowd, but in staying in a place where trouble was brewing. Yes, he could have walked away as soon as it started, and there would have been no shame except to himself. What had kept him there? 
Why hadn't the police realized that he'd been telling his friends to leave as soon as the Angelo came out of the shadows <coughs> twirling his nightstick? Buddy's real need was to tell his story to someone who would sympathize, even if it was a priest. Tell him how the punishment didn't fit the crime. But why lay his misery on some naive priest who would ask him not only to forgive D'Angelo, but every cop in the precinct? Forgive them? It wasn't funny to think about this little reversal. Definitely not funny when they threw him in the back seat of the squad car with hands cuffed behind his back and a plain close cop on either side. The one on his left, a detective named Brian Knapp, said, when we're through, you'll piss blood. The other said, turn and face me. When Buddy did so, Knapp jammed a nightstick into his kidney and pushed hard. That's what I mean, he said. And he'd been true to his word, for both Steve and Buddy had blood in their urine for days. The squad car beating lasted until they arrived at the precinct, where Buddy was yanked from the car and pushed and kicked inside with Steve behind him getting the same treatment, their entry greeted with cries of, where are those cop fighters? The voices had all the joy of a surprise party. <laughs> and for a fraction of a second, now shameful to his intelligence, Buddy entertained the notion that the police had forgiven them, that the beatings in the cars were the end of it, and now they would all be friends and have a good life. But no, the voices were angry. And Buddy and Steve were pushed into separate rooms where the world couldn't go black fast enough. 